Hi, Anna. Welcome to my presentation. Really appreciate you taking the time to watch it. Uh, so when I was thinking about what I would be discussing during this presentation, I looked back at the entire rotation and I really tried to pick something that challenged me, something that really frustrated me throughout the entire rotation and something that I think that I could really improve on. Uh, and, you know, the, the topic that immediately came to mind was benzodiazepine use in the elderly. You know, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but I, I feel that at this point, everybody knows the negative effects of these medications, especially in the elderly, those 65 and over, uh, numerous adverse reactions, falls, fractures, cognitive impairment, motor vehicle accidents, the list goes on and on and on. And I feel that at this point, there have been countless studies published on how harmful these medications are and how deprescribing them has been the primary focus of uh, most research when it comes to benzodiazepines. I feel that these days, these medica there's more focus on how to deprescribe these medications than prescribing them, if that makes any sense. And time and time again, whenever I'm doing a meds check, whenever I'm counseling a patient, and I, I bring up discontinuing the benzodiazepine, they always give me the same story. They always say, uh, you know, I, the doctor put me on this, so it must be, it must be helpful, it must be safe. Or, oh, I've been taking this medication since 1985 and I'm fine and I, I don't have any side effects. And it's just a really frustrating part of um, practicing as a pharmacist when you know that as time goes by, uh, patients develop a tolerance to the effect of the medication in the sense that it doesn't really help with the condition it's treating, the insomnia or even the anxiety. But not only that, but how... As we age, we develop a sensitivity to the adverse effects of these medications. And it's frustrating knowing all this information. And, you know, th these prescribers just keep on uh, keep on continuing these medications, keep on prescribing them for a new onset diagnosis of insomnia. And it's just frustrating because it clashes with everything that I've been taught in school. And uh, so I did a little bit of research on, uh, you know, approaches to discuss with patients approaches to get them on board with discontinuing the benzodiazepine or at least um, at least talking about potentially discontinuing them or slowly tapering. And I landed upon a few interesting articles. Uh, one was on deprescribing.org. It was um, a, a guideline recommendation by, on, uh, it was originally published on Canadian Family Physician, I believe, was the article. And uh, goes through an algorithm of how to deprescribe, uh, how to deprescribe. The benzodiazepines and uh, when I say benzodiazepines I also mean uh, Z type drugs like Zoploclone, Zolpidem, not just lorazepam, clonazepam, you know the classic benzos. Uh, it's, it's an all-encompassing category of medications and I found an art a very interesting article there uh, with some very useful tools. Also uh, the magazine that I borrowed the other day has an article on insomnia which got me thinking about it as well. It has a lot of interesting um, a lot of interesting aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy, of how to treat insomnia non-pharmacologically. And uh, yeah, I'll just be going through uh, going through these two resources with you, what I gleaned from them, what I learned from them, and how I'll be taking it forward into my, into my practice going forward. So I should start by prefacing that a lot of the evidence that I've gleaned um, from my research has to do with benzodiazepine use for insomnia rather than anxiety, which is a whole... A whole other ballpark, a whole other can of worms that I don't want to get into right now. But uh, definitely for insomnia, there is very little place for benzodiazepines. As we all know, uh, they're not first-line therapy, and they aren't even recommended. Uh, they aren't even re really recommended as second-line therapy. Oh, so really? They shouldn't. You shouldn't even be prescribing a benzodiazepine because time and time again, the efficacy of these medications has been, you know, has been scrutinized and shown to not really improve sleep in the long run. It might help short term, like in a few days to a few weeks. But after that, after you get that initial benefit, some studies even show that after, you know, four weeks maximum, the effect, the sedative effect of the benzodiazepine just completely wears off. But the amnestic effect, the amnesia, uh, the anterograde memory loss and all the side effects and that I already mentioned earlier, such as cognitive decline, falls, fractures, they persist. So really the efficacy of these medications is limited to the very short term. And yet we have these elderly people that have been taking these medications 
sometimes for over 20 years. And it's just, it's just very disappointing. One meta analysis even showed that within that short period of time, uh, the one to four weeks, the efficacy of the benzodiazepine only improved sleep latency time by four minutes and also only gave an additional hour of sleep, which isn't a huge, isn't a huge difference. So the efficacy of benzodiazepines, needless to say, is very minimal. And, uh, for that reason, they aren't, they, they shouldn't be prescribed as first-line therapy. In fact, they're listed on the Beers criteria of dangerous medications, which is basically a list of medications that should not be used in the elderly. Uh, it's probably number one on the list. And yet, time and time again, we get prescriptions for 70, 80, even 90-year-olds on these benzodiazepines. And uh, again, it's just, it's just very, very frustrating. And another very interesting fact about benzodiazepine use in the elderly is that as we age, it actually becomes more and more dangerous to use these medications because the benzodiazepine receptor itself, the gamma aminobutyric type A receptor, actually changes as we age. It actually becomes more sensitive to the amnesia effects of the benzodiazepine and less sensitive to the, sed the sedative effects. So as time goes on, uh, the elderly are more and more likely to experience side effects, whereas uh, if the medication was safe and effective back when they were 60 years old. That might not be the case when they're 80 or 90 years old. Things change and the receptor actually, they actually lose their tolerance to the, the adverse effects of the benzodiazepine. So needless to say, uh, benzodiazepine should be deprescribed in the elderly, but you know, that's easier said than done. It's easy to, to know all this information and uh, know that is, it is the right thing to do, but it's a whole other thing to actually convince an elderly person to taper off their benzodiazepine. And uh, that's where that guideline came in. They did a meta-analysis, and uh, they found that when tapering at a rate of 20% of the dose every two weeks, they found that at the 12-month mark, the, the group in the study that was tapering versus the group of the study that remained on the benzodiazepine had no difference whatsoever in sleep quality at the 12-month mark. Sure, the, the group that was tapering off the benzodiazepine did experience some withdrawal symptoms, some minor insomnia throughout the process. But at the 12-month mark, which is a drop in the bucket compared to the decades that these people have been taking the medications, their insomnia was no different from the group that continued the benzodiazepines. So tapering at a 20%, uh, and of course that could be adjusted depending on the patient, at a 20% rate has really shown to be effective at uh, deprescribing the benzodiazepines. And a lot of the patients find that were enrolled in the study that the withdrawal symptoms were much less severe than they were thinking and uh, their cognition improved. There were less falls, fractures, other side effects in that group. And uh, it was just, it was a very promising study. So I definitely encourage you, if you wanna learn more, to read uh, the deprescribing.org article on benzodiazepines is very informative. Uh, but now the question is, how do we get patients on board with this? Now, communication skills are, are definitely important in the pharmacy. And uh, I feel that the main problem, the main reason why patients continue these medications is that prescribers just don't have the time to go in depth and really communicate the negative aspects of taking them. I feel that prescribers feel that patients have been taking them for so many years and, uh, they just try to maintain the status quo and they don't want, really want to rock the boat by making drastic changes in the patient's life. And maybe the patient, you know, just shows some initial resistance and the prescriber doesn't really want to deal with that at the moment. So they brush it off and they postpone it to the next appointment. And then that cycle continues until the patient ends up 20 years down the road, still on the benzodiazepine. So I think the most important thing is to sit the patient down and weigh the risks and benefits of the medication. Definitely let them know about the risks of taking it. And the most important thing is letting them know that although you might be tolerating the medication now, 10 years down the road, your body physically changes. The receptors, you might not want to use that terminology, but you know your body changes to the point where you're not, these medications won't affect you in the same way. And it could lead to negative, uh, it could lead to uh, dangerous side effects down the road. Again, a fall and a fracture can be completely devastating for a 90-year-old uh a 90-year-old woman who has osteoporosis and you you'd rather discontinue this medication sooner rather than later and i think really emphasizing that really repeating that over and over again 
can can really be helpful in letting the patient know, especially when they say, oh, you know what, I've been taking this for 10, 15 years, and I'm, I've been fine. Let them know that you're fine now, but 10 years down the road, it's going to be a different story. I think that's that's really important to emphasize. And uh, also to emphasize that, you know, if you are, if they get on board with tapering down, and they are experiencing some, some withdrawal symptoms, definitely slow down the tapering rate. I mean, if you're going down at 20% per week, and by the third week they're having some withdrawal symptoms, maybe slow down to about 10% that next week. So rather than decreasing the dose by, you know, 5 milligrams of whatever the medication is, maybe decrease by 2.5 milligrams. And provide the patient with a tapering schedule, a calendar, follow up every week, see how they're doing. It's, it's a, it's a time-consuming process, but I think it's something that's very worthwhile to do. And most importantly, we should always be communicating that these withdrawal symptoms can occur. So the patient should expect it. They should know that withdrawal symptoms can happen, but that could definitely be minimized by slowing down the tapering rate. So let them know that, you know, you might have a little bit more anxiety one day. You might have a little bit of trouble sleeping, but these effects don't last long. And in fact, in the study I mentioned, they only lasted a couple of days. Worst case scenario for one week or so uh, during the tapering process. So it's good to just set their expectations straight that, you know, you know, if you are experiencing these symptoms, don't just stop. Don't just go back to your usual dose. Just let the pharmacist know, let the physician know, and they'll slow down the tapering rate. That way they don't start thinking that, oh my God, without this medication, I'm never going to be able to fall asleep. Because if they think that, they'll fall back into a vicious cycle. So setting the expectations straight right at the start is uh, very, very important. And again, we're... We're pharmacists. We don't have that much control over tapering benzodiazepines, but it's definitely something that we could discuss with prescribers, especially during meds checks. It's always worthwhile to just write a note to the doctor, like, please discuss tapering the benzodiazepine. And I think that instilling the information into the patient would, would really help them to bring it up at their next appointment with the doctor. Say, listen, doctor, I'm the pharmacist keeps uh, bugging me about stopping this medication. Maybe it's in my best interest. And that might... It, you know, that might get the physician on board with uh, tapering the benzo. So those are a few a few strategies that uh, the guideline recommended there. Now, uh, for the rest of the presentation, I just wanted to discuss some cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, how, how this treatment really helps uh, with insomnia and is really shown to be the most effective treatment rather than benzodiazepines, which is considered a quick fix. So what can the patient actually do to treat their insomnia without medication? Well, the first pillar of cognitive behavioral therapy is called stimulus control. And what stimulus control does is it kind of dampens the conditioned hyperarousal that a lot of insomnia patients feel when they go to sleep. We all know the vicious cycle. You go to sleep, you had a poor night's sleep the night before, and you're just worried that you're not going to be able to get a good sleep. You're not going to be able to function the next day. And that creates a tense kind of hyperaroused state of mind that is a vicious cycle and prevents you from falling asleep. And, you know, for most people, this doesn't last long. But for 10 to 15% of the population, this can be a chronic condition. And, uh, and stimulus control is definitely the most important aspect of CBD or cognitive behavioral therapy for this type of population. Where they have this kind of vicious cycle of thinking about falling asleep, which actually prevents them from doing so. Now, with stimulus control, the patient is instructed to actually leave the bedroom after 15 to 20 minutes of failure of falling asleep. And what this does, it allows the patient to escape the bedroom and lose the association that the bedroom is a place of anxiety, a place of restlessness. And it allows the patient to get back into a frame of mind where they aren't focusing on falling asleep. And then once they do something else for about half an hour or so, uh, you know, obviously limiting TV, limiting light exposure, they go back to bed and they try again and they rinse and repeat the process until they end up falling asleep. And this is very important because when the bedroom is associated with anxiety and associated with that vicious cycle, that just perpetuates the insomnia indefinitely. And that's something we definitely don't want. So stimulus control, very important aspect of uh, CBT. Now, the second most important aspect I would say is sleep hygiene. And, uh, you know, we tell patients time and time again, to, about sleep hygiene and what I mean by this is just just getting some exercise throughout your day to get your body get your melatonin going get your body just naturally ready for that state at the end of the day 
where you need rest, where the rest is actually needed to recharge the batteries per se. So doing a little bit of exercise during the day, you know, you don't have to go crazy, but you know, walk, doing some walking in the evening, maybe after dinner, can really get the body into that calm state of mind, as well as avoiding napping during the day, which offsets the entire sleep cycle, you know, eating too close to bedtime within about two hours of going to sleep, uh, especially heavy meals that can cause heartburn and further uh, further prevent the sleep cycle. Just uh, basic things like that, avoiding watching TV, avoiding stimulus, and, uh, you know, not really bringing your problems to the bedroom. And that could be that could be easier said than done, especially after a very stressful day. But uh, just meditating maybe 10, 15 minutes before trying to go to bed. Just basic things like this that have been scientifically proven to improve sleep. So sleep hygiene, definitely very important. Also setting up the bedroom, making it comfortable, having a comfortable temperature, uh, you know, layering the bed sheets. That way you can adjust to, to suit your individual needs in the middle of the night when it comes to temperature can really help as well. Uh, avoiding caffeine too close to bedtime, uh, alcohol, the list goes on and on. Because although alcohol does uh, improve the rate of falling asleep, obviously, uh, it ultimately results in a poor sleep quality, early awakening, nightmares, but sleep hygiene, very important. Uh, another important aspect of, of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is sleep drive. And what this pillar focuses on is actually restricting the amount of time you're in the bedroom to your total sleep time, which is calculated by how many hours of sleep you actually get per night. So if you get four hours of sleep, then you go to bed four hours before a set awakening time, and then you gradually increase the amount of time by which you go to sleep by 15 minutes. So for example, if you go to sleep the night before at around, I don't know, let's say 3 a.m., and you wake up at 8, getting five hours of sleep, then the next day go to bed at 2... 2.45 and then the night before 2.30 and so on and so on. That way you're actually uh, gradually tapering up uh, or titrating up the amount of sleep you get. Now this part kind of confused me at first but it does make sense because the idea is uh, it provides a mild sleep deprivation which is essential for consolidating the sleep as well as resolving the hyper arousal. So at first I was thinking wait depriving your sleep to improve your sleep it doesn't really make any sense but when you think about it that way, it actually, it does seem to be helpful. So sleep drive, another important aspect, definitely the most confusing to me, but I'm, I'm starting to understand it. And then of course, relaxation therapy with meditation can always help, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy, which would be a one-on-one -on -one kind of session with a, you know, a healthcare provider, which is the most, I don't know, probably the, the part of it that's the most unfeasible. I can't imagine many people doing that. But definitely sleep hygiene, stimulus control, and sleep drive, those three pillars I just mentioned, are definitely very helpful. So, you know, in conclusion, I, I find that a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as setting expectations for the patient, letting them know the, the risks of continuing benzodiazepine use, and uh, really just following up continuously, working with the physician, definitely reminding the patient during every meds check, during every, during every fill if possible, definitely improve this, this scenario and make it a less frustrating aspect of pharmacy practice, both for the pharmacist and a more safe and effective way of approaching insomnia for the patient. So thanks for watching, Anna, and it's been a pleasure uh, having you as my preceptor. It's been a fantastic rotation, and I wish everyone all the best. Thank you very much.